What is so significant about the story of Naaman the leper? The simple answer to this question is that this story is inspirational. The things that these characters did and said teach us many important lessons about how we can serve God in our own lives. And in this video, I'd like to go through the story with all of you so that we can discuss all the great things we can learn. Beginning from verse 1 of 2 Kings chapter 5. Now, Naaman, captain of the host of the king of Syria, was a great man with his master and honorable, because by him the Lord had given deliverance unto Syria. He was also a mighty man in valor, but he was a leper. And the Syrians had gone out by companies and had brought away captive out of the land of Israel a little maid, and she waited on Naaman's wife. And she said unto her mistress, Would God my lord were with the prophet that is in Samaria, for he would recover him of his leprosy. Let's stop here for a moment and just take in the greatness of the faith that this person is showing. Because she grew up in a culture where God Almighty was known to be someone who could do anything, as the three angels told Abraham, is there anything too hard for the Lord? In Genesis chapter 18 verse 14, she grew up understanding and believing in the fact that God Almighty could indeed solve any problem. So the leprosy of Naaman was certainly not something too big for God to take care of. If you read Romans chapter 10 verse 17, Paul spoke about how knowledge can build this kind of faith. So then faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. The next few verses just describe how the word got to the king of Syria about how Naaman could receive healing and then the king sent Naaman to the land. But let me now jump to verse 9 of the story because that's where it really gets interesting. So Naaman came with his horses and with his chariot and stood at the door of the house of Elisha. And Elisha sent a messenger unto him, saying, Go, and wash in Jordan seven times, and thy flesh shall come again to thee, and thou shalt be clean. But Naaman was wroth, and went away, and said, Behold, I thought he will surely come out to me, and stand, and call on the name of the Lord his God, and strike his hand over the place, and recover the leper. What we should understand about this part is the fact that, because Naaman was so great, being the commander of the Syrian army, he had high expectations. He didn't expect to be coming to a poor man's house and the poor man Elisha wouldn't even come out and do something magical so that he would be healed. No, he just sent out his servant Gehazi to come and tell him the instructions. He felt dishonored by what had happened. He then said, Are not Abana and Farpar, rivers of Damascus, better than all the waters of Israel? May I not wash in them and be clean? So he turned and went away in a rage. And his servants came near and spake unto him and said, My father, if the prophet had bid thee do some great thing, wouldst thou not have done it? How much rather than when he saith to thee, Wash and be clean? This is another really significant part of the story because here we learn that Naaman indeed was actually a humble man. He was approachable. His servants could come to him and tell him something that he should do. And also that little phrase, wash and be clean, is spiritually significant because that is also what we should do as Christians if we want to be pure before God. As Isaiah the prophet had said in Isaiah chapter 1 verse 16, wash you, make you clean. Put away the evil of your doings from before mine eyes. Cease to do evil. Learn to do well. And so on and so forth. And the psalmist said in Psalm 119 verses 9 and 11, Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed thereto according to thy word. Thy word have I hid in mine heart, that I may not sin against thee. And all the rivers that Naaman was mentioning in verse 12 of the chapter refer to other places in this world where you find people teaching other doctrines than the truth. Some of them are wealthy. Their cathedrals are majestic. Everybody's well dressed. It just looks better. But the truth isn't really there. Sometimes the people preaching the truth might not be the most attractive, but they're holding pure words. If you read Psalms chapter 12, for six. So sometimes it's simple things that we do that actually make the greatest change in our lives. 
So then verse 14 says, Then went he down and dipped himself seven times in Jordan, according to the saying of the man of God. And his flesh came again like unto the flesh of a little child, and he was clean. And he returned to the man of God, he and all his company, and came and stood before him. And he said, Behold, now I know that there is no God in all the earth but in Israel. Now therefore I pray thee, take a blessing of thy servant. This is similar to what happened in 1 Kings chapter 17, verse 24, when Elijah had healed the son of the widow of Zarephath, and that was when she also knew and realized that God Almighty truly is powerful. He is indeed the Almighty. But then something interesting happened. But he said, As the Lord liveth before whom I stand, I will receive none. And he urged him to take it, but he refused. The reason why Elisha refused was not because Naaman was maliciously or pretentiously giving these gifts. No, they were sincere, but Elisha wanted Naaman to go away with the understanding that his money was of no value spiritually. This was just a free gift that God had given to show him that he indeed is almighty. And you can see also in Daniel chapter 5 that Daniel refused the gifts of Belshazzar for the exact same reason. The next interesting part is in verse 20. But Gehazi, the servant of Elisha, the man of God, said, Behold, my master hath spared Naaman the Syrian, and not receiving at his hands that which he brought. But as the Lord liveth, I will run after him, and take somewhat of him. So Gehazi followed after Naaman. And when Naaman saw him running after him, he lighted down from the chariot to meet him, and said, Is all well? And he said, All is well. My master hath sent me, saying, Behold, even now there be come to me from Mount Ephraim two young men of the sons of the prophets. Give them, I pray thee, a talent of silver, and two changes of garments. And Naaman said, Be content, take two talents. And he urged him, and bound two talents of silver in two bags, with two changes of garments, and laid them upon two of his servants, and they bare them before him. See, what Gehazi did here was not just foolish, it was actually wicked, because when Elisha had sent Naaman away, Naaman was leaving with a very strong message, that it was God Almighty who freely gave him this gift. It wasn't his money that paid for it, it was just God Almighty showing love and grace to him. But with Gehazi coming back after Elisha already dismissed the gift, now coming to say, oh, Elisha needs these gifts now to serve a couple of guests that he had, he was not only cheapening the name of his master Elisha by lying against him, but he was also stealing the glory that God had gotten in that instance. And that is very bad. And that was why the psalmist said, Give unto the Lord the glory due unto his name. Bring an offering and come into his courts. And then this story continues. And when he came to the tower, he took them from their hand and bestowed them in the house. And he let the men go, and they departed. But he went in and stood before his master. And Elisha said unto him, Whence comest thou, Gehazi? And he said, Thy servant went no whither. And he said unto him, Went not mine heart with thee when the man turned again from his chariot to meet thee? Is it a time to receive money, and to receive garments, and olive yards, and vine yards, and sheep, and oxen, and men servants, and maid servants? The leprosy therefore of Naaman shall cleave unto thee, and unto thy seed forever. And he went out from his presence a leper as white as snow. Now you might ask, why didn't Elisha go back to Naaman to clear his name so that Naaman would know that it was a lie that was told against him? But Elisha was a man of God. There was no real need for all of that. He just pronounced judgment based on the wickedness that Gehazi had done, and he moved on with his life. If you also read Acts chapter 13, verses 1 to 12, you can see that Paul did the same thing. When Elamus the sorcerer wanted to prevent someone from hearing the gospel, Paul cursed him and he went out of his presence, not being able to see for a season. And that is where I'm going to stop on answering this question. What is so significant about the story of Naam and the leper? I got to tell you, there are so many more lessons that we can extract from this story, but... Time will only permit what we've been able to get to, but I would encourage you to go back into the story and see what else you can learn from it, because the Bible is all about 
learning lessons, and finding new things to inspire us in our day-to-day -day lives as we seek God and do His will. So, if you enjoyed this video and liked the way I explained this story, then I'd appreciate if you click the like button and also the subscribe button. And you can click the notification bell as well if you want to be notified when we come back with a new video just like this. Have a good day and God bless you.